How you guys doing? I'm going to Darlington for both the series this weekend. Let's just jump right in when we take a gander at where everybody's priced at for Xfinity. I'm not necessarily usually concerned about pricing early in the week. I mean, any of these guys can work. Like, you can make cases for and against each of these guys based on salary in a week. I typically don't enjoy doing that. I Pretty much the only thing I look at is what's the bottom of the salary looking like? What's the top of the salary looking like? We don't really have any expensive drivers here. I mean, 111K, it's Bell, okay, whatever. All guy are second, but like these prices aren't necessarily too bad. When we look at where people have been at in these races now, yet again, I never add Michigan to this anyway, so we don't need to worry about that because it was, I mean, we don't need to worry about that because it was a wreck vest anyway. But when we're looking at an idea of where um, Bell is going to perform, now Bell has not ran intermediate this year in the Xfinity series, he's ran loud in some other places, but when we basically look at the two you know, cars that are rotating drivers in and out of the Joe Gibbs machines this year, the 19 and the 20. Uh, you can basically just look at, you can look at Nemechek, you can look at Eric Amarola, you can look at, you know, Truex, Ryan, that is, in these races, and more so Gibbs, and you can understand that, you know, the 20 car is going to be just fine for Christopher Bell. It's just going to come down to, you know, where these guys start. We don't have Hamlin running a Darlington race this year, so that's at least a bit relieving because we don't have to worry about him, you know, leading the charge for the uh, Xfinity Series season. But we can go ahead and just do this really fast and kind of look at where everybody's at. Go ahead and just put that here. So we look at Bell. We've already talked about him. We look at Allgaier. I mean, everybody's priced pretty much where they should be. I mean, Allgaier is, you know, the most consistent guy, so on and so forth. Like, none of this should be necessarily surprising. Now, we do have Elliot in this and not um, Larson and or Bowman. Now, he did have the best car at Charlotte, which is uh, not surprising at all. I don't believe Bowman's ran. I don't believe Larson has ran. So we're just looking at, you know, pretty much Elliott showing up and being the best car at Charlotte. So that's, you know, truly not a surprise. And the fact that Elliott is in here moves everybody else down a peg. I mean, Logano is in the AM racing machine if I'm not mistaken let me go take a look really fast pretty sure yeah it is Logano which is uh yeah, we don't need to race to, we don't need to waste race time with that now you look at Barry having a pretty uh pretty dreadful day in this car now you know did run the issues and have a tire go down um and William Byron who also uh ran into a tire issue at Pocono, uh, practically almost went a lap down, got saved by a yellow, was able to drive through the field, and still, you know, ended up with the sixth best car. I mean, that that's looking pretty good for Elliott, just straight up. I mean, I I would honestly argue that I think Elliott is probably the favorite entering the week to win the race, but uh, yet again, that's on a Thursday. We race Saturday. We haven't had practice and or qualifying. That's just kind of where I'm standing here, but it's most likely um, Elliot Allgaier and Bell as your, as your favorites entering in this race. What I mainly want to look at is this middle pack of where everybody else is at and kind of identify people that would probably easily get in the lineups. Now you look at Herbst and you look at, you know, not only where he's priced, but we can pro we can argue that, yeah, sure. I mean, Logano isn't going to out cue him. I mean, Gregson's been doing his, his own thing in the 30 car. Um, like these guys haven't been necessarily bad, but her, when you look at Herbst and, and, and Custer, you know, the main thing that brings them down is that they usually start in the top four and it makes it really difficult to play Herbst because you kind of default to Cole Custer being the primary lap leader. And then you really don't see an out for Herbst to get the lead. Okay. This is a race that I think we have a real chance of having Herbst Qualify outside of the top 10 with the potential of Sammy Smith queuing well, Corey Heim queuing well, Parker queuing well, on top of everybody else in front of him. I mean, I think Riley Herbst arguably makes a lot of sense here. Sixth best car in the spring. And I'm, I mean, yet again, entering the race. I mean, this is just an intermediate track. This is where everybody is. Like, we're not everybody on the left, uh, you know. Uh, it There's nothing really, really shocking when it comes to this like especially you know we're entering pretty much the third and you could argue like the fourth quarter we're like in the middle of the third 
entering the fourth quarter of the season for all these guys. I mean, we've, we've typically seen where everybody's at. You know, people either are working out or not working out due to circumstances, either damages, flat tires, when cautions come out, et cetera, et cetera. We have seen uh, Chandler Smith, where are you at? Bit of an overprice. Uh, really have no... Uh, we'll put Chandler there. Going to have very little interest in Chandler Smith uh, due to the fact that he's taken a pretty significant s- step down. I don't foresee a scene. Austin Hill. I mean, second best car in the spring race at Darlington is good to see. But, um, personally, just I, I, I am concerned that we're going to, like I already said, Elliot at Allgaier, and probably Bell will be the interest. Like, we, pr- we pretty much lose the ability to play Austin Hill, Creed, and Chandler Smith, because those guys are all expected to lead like right off the bat and stuff. And so, like, I think our main group we're looking at is like just these four. Everybody else is going to be dependent on where they qualify and if, you know, they can even pay off their price tag. What I really want to look at is, is this bottom of the pack uh, type of stuff. When we look at Joe Graff Jr., I believe he's in the 19, if I'm not mistaken. He is in the 19 which I do not believe he's ran an intermediate this year outside of Indy, uh, but even then that got a bit crazy. What is he at? 35 points for Joe Graff Jr., a real chance he can get done. I don't think Graff is going to queue well. Good to see from there. Carson Quaffle. What's going on here? i got to take a call really fast. Hold on. All right, I believe I was going through the middle tier fellas. Um, I believe Carson's 72, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, he's 72. Um, I mean, let's take it. Let's take a gander. I mean, Carson, Ryan Sieg, Joe Graff Jr., all guys in the 7K range, even Parker at 73. You know, Sammy Smith at 75 as well. Jesse Love at 78. I mean, this 7K range is pretty much where. I'm going to mainly be focusing, unless things just go haywire and all these idiots qualify like top 10 or something. But I find it hard to believe that we're not going to be, you know, keeping the, or building, not even building. Like, look at Jesse Love, right? Real chance top 10 contender, okay? Look at Jones, real chance he either cues well and or qualifies poorly, very easily going to default to like, you know, the best car. We look at Sammy, Sammy Smith. 11 best car by default. We look at Park Klingerman, who's, you know, fighting to get in this stupid chase. Who's truly, excuse me, all over the place when it comes to intermediates. I mean, he did get, you know, he was the fifth best car at Darlington in the spring. But, um, like, Ryan Sieg, like, this, like, Ryan Sieg seems to me like, you know, a cornerstone of just lineups entering the weekend. I mean, we can see that he's clearly underpriced or mispriced in the 7K range. Like, all these guys, all these 7K range guys have been bumped down, you know, three, four, five positions in terms of salary due to the amount of, you know, cup guys in this race, you know. And so if you're playing, you know, Mel with Allgaier, then, hey, guess what? You're in the 6 and 7K range. I mean, that's that's not, um, you know, that that's surprising. Like, Shane... Probably not going to get to him at, at Darlington. But you look at Retzloff. I mean, Alfredo, if I'm not mistaken, he's been pretty decent. You look at where Jeb has been. Like, nearly everybody down here. I don't know about Josh. Even Matt. We kind of run back into a plateau between, like, Matt Benedetto, Clements, Kyle Sieg. Not Kyle Sieg. Uh, Weatherman and Sieg, actually. Um... We look at Poole, who's probably going to queue last, has a real chance of packing people. So, like, pretty much between, we can argue Jesse Love to, we'll say Joe Graff Jr., these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 drivers. We can kind of argue that all these, all eight of these drivers are underpriced. And if, which I would imagine Chalk is going to, align with whoever one of these guys either cues the worst and or has an amazing time in, in practice and just looks like you know the fastest car in this range um, but I would not be shocked to be building you know completely around two to three of these guys with either one or two of these expensive guys like this is what I mean at least when I try to approach this stuff like up top does not matter at all 
in terms of approaching it right or wrong. I mean, yes, clearly, you know, if you have the guy who leads laps and competes for the win, like, you're going to need that guy. But for the most part, this is not where the lineup is won and lost at. You might arbitrarily look at it and be like, well, yeah, it is. Like, you're either getting the guy who leads laps or who doesn't. But, you know, who you're building around these people, you know, are you going stars and scrubs? Or are you going like a more, you know, go up top and then build balance lineups and, you know, punt at the bottom of the salary, whatever the case may be? Um, that is where, you know, I envision this, this, this race being, you know, on, on this Thursday. I mean, when you start looking at where Paul Perkins, Leland, Greg, Smith, Lee, Chad, Ellis, and, and Gase is, I mean, Ellis is going to make the race. He's most likely going to start in the back of the field at $4,900. You know, you play Ryan Ellis with one of these mid-range guys and then, or not one, you know, an arbitrary number, whatever it is plus the guys you're going with, like, that seems like the real way to approach this. Let's just, we'll use, we really don't even need to worry about pull, but we'll we'll include, like, three as individual drivers, and then, you know, we'll just highlight these four. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I mean, just right off the bat, I mean, these are, like, very easily, you know, 16, 17 places for you to see where where lineups would go here, unless we see now this is one thing I will say that that isn't we don't need to wait till the weekend unless we see somebody in this range show an absolute high amount of speed and or start first we're most likely not outside of them you know missing Q or starting last forever we're most likely not aiming at this range in salary and we're most likely not aiming in this range of salary okay so. I think by that, I guess you could argue either true stars and scrubs with, you know, either a double punt here or one punt with Ellis, a couple 7K guys, and then get to whoever you want up top. I mean, I think that's the preview for for Pocono for the, for the Xfinity series. Like, I don't think there's anything too crazy past that in any, in any shape or form. Now, as we move on to Cup, the reason I didn't really talk about, you know, the Rex or the DNF percentages for the Cup series is because it's... Shorter race, we typically see the field spread out. Yeah, sure, we'll have people wreck on a restart or whatever, but we typically aren't worried about attrition nearly as much as we do in the Cup Series. If we just look back in the last five-ish races, one, two, three, yeah, we got the last five here. So we look back at the spring. I mean, Chris Buescher and Reddick kill themselves at the end, give it to Keselowski, who only inherited that chance to win this race by other people running into issues, Kyle Larson and uh, people like that. Um... With, you know, also Trix and Blaney and Busher again, being involved in a, in a crash uh, off turn two on a restart, um, coming to the end of a stage, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, no, that was just a regular, regular yellow. Now, this race is 293. We're running 367 uh, this weekend. So, uh, we can just argue. It's not, ex- I mean, you know, it's like 70 more laps. But really, it's, it's almost like 100 more laps, but practically. Like, it, it's... Uh, nearly a 400 mile or 400 lap race. I mean, we're going to have a huge amount of leaders. I mean, when you just look at the leader breakdown in terms of, you know, and yet again, we only ran 13% of this race under under yellow, just based on last year. We'll kind of go through and look at these really fast. Another 13 here. I mean, 13.9, 15. We look at this race here, 15. We look at this race here. This is 16. So uh, pretty much we're, we're looking at at least 85, give or take, percent of this race. Rand under green. Okay, as we continue to go through, we just see average green flag run of, of you know, over 30 laps shorter on these. But yet again, this is at 293. Playoff race, but a lot of yellows. Excuse me. Um, I mean, we're, we're doing pretty much green flag runs here. This is not a situation where... Um, we're going to have a lot of attrition and typically the attrition that we do see in these races, you see it end up being pretty high, you know, competing guys or guys either running, uh, for the lead guys leading laps, uh, guys who are up front pushing, you know, and, and constantly trying to be up there, uh, leaders rather like this is a pretty, this is a very, very volatile race for leaders. So this is a race where I would not want to be uh, having high exposure to one or even two uh, primary lap leaders. I expect this race to be pretty, uh, maybe not insane in terms of 
uh, crazy, but the burn rate of lap leaders is pretty high here, whether it be pit road speeding, hitting the wall, breaking a tow link, getting in the wall, um, strategy not working their way. I mean, I, I would expect to see a lot of lap leaders in this event, and yet again, this, this spring race was you know, no different. We have Busher and Reddick both run into issues. Now, Reddick was optimal at his price tag, finishing 32nd here. Um, but for the most part, I mean, this guy leads nearly 200 laps. The guys who finish the race, you know, lead right at uh, like 70 laps of the race. Everybody else like didn't do anything. Um, pretty, pretty wild uh, turn of events in, in, in just these Darlington races. When you look at the amount of, of lap leaders running into issues and where they finish um, in this race. So, you know, yet again, we, we always want to have as many lap leaders as possible. This is a race where I would spread ownership out. Just, you know, entering this weekend, uh, I would want to be spreading ownership out uh, amongst, you know, just a ton of drivers. I, I think this is a race where you open that pull up exponentially compared to the normal and even Xfinity series. Like, you know, I mentioned, you know, that like, oh, here's 16, 70 guys or, you know, the way we would build. This is a race where like the pool is probably like 25, 26 drivers um, for what they can do. And the amount of strategies of do you short pit, do you stay out one or two laps, are you trying to leapfrog people, et cetera, et cetera, on top of the stages and I, I, on top of the stage yellows, uh, like pit road's a huge thing here, the pit crews are a huge thing here, the driver and crew chief combination of do they prefer to short pit, do they prefer to stay out and run long, um, if you're short putting it clearly helps out the... Uh, RFK, the Joe Gibbs brigade of, you know, Bell, Hamlin, Truex. Gibbs is kind of doing his own thing. We, we don't really have a tendency that he falls into at the moment. Um, but RFK is going to do things aggressively. Front row motorsport is going to do things aggressively. When we look at people who expect to go long, the Spire cars, Colleague cars, Trackhouse cars, um, even the Stuart Haas cars, we've seen them potentially running longer in certain situations. And so I expect to see a lot of leaders in this race this weekend. Um, that's just kind of where I'm at when we're looking at just kind of where everybody's priced at. Uh, I, I think pricing kind of reflects that. I mean, sure, Hamlin and, and Larson are the most expensive. Reddit coming off its domination in spring. Um, but really, like, there's no big favorite here in terms of what they're doing in the salary range. When we look at Kaz Grawl at 52, look at Haley at 57, just right off the bat. Um, Hamrick, 53. I mean, I have no issue using... Hamrick, Grala, Haley, Zane Smith, Nemechek, like none of these guys are have have any worries at all. I'm a little worried about Priest, but he has pretty much my least amount of uh, interest here. Anywhere from from LaJoy to Kaz Grala, I think it's wide open. I, I don't think you should have any uh, negative thoughts towards any of these guys down here. Any of them can work out. I've already mentioned that Spire and Colleague typically tend to run long or at least get off different sequences and stuff uh, in these races. Now, I will say I don't think we're going to see nearly as a high potential for these guys to lead laps if they stay out on a green flag pit st or a green flag run compared to a place like Richmond or other short tracks because I think these individual drivers will probably already be a lap down. Realistically, it's hard for you to get the lead if you're running long, if you were already a lap down and leader pitted or whatever. And so when we're looking at, you know, people who are going to potentially lead laps in this race, this is where a lot of the, you know, mid-range guys come into play because you have your primary guys that you're playing because you think they can win or lead laps or whatever. But this is this is a race to where, you know, the mid-range, these are the people who are going to run long, inherit the lead off of pit lane, run long and get some laps led, you know, pit potentially either pit early and or pit late and scrape off one, two, three fast laps in a race, in a race that has 360-ish laps. You know, this is a race where I would probably start projecting the entire field-ish. And yet again, I mean, if you project everybody to get a fast lap, well, then you kind of nullify it. You know, if everybody's getting fast laps, nobody's getting fast laps. But uh, you could argue, you could realistically argue that, you know, three to four fast laps for each of these individual drivers as a baseline, regardless before we even get to queue or practice or whatever, is a pretty decent projection um, with the potential of guys running long, uh, so on and so forth. When we look at where these guys are at here, now we can go ahead and, I guess, analyze this one because this is a lot more price sensitive, or at least people like doing this a lot more, and we can kind of 
try and understand what DraftKings is doing with the pricing. Yet again, pricing is irrelevant. It just comes down to you know what these guys do. That's why I don't bring the pricing over here. We're just looking at where these guys are at. Hamlin has been the most consistent driver over the end of last year and this year. Uh, we look at Larson. We know what we get from Larson. He's going to be continuing. He's going to win the race or finish last. No surprise there. We look at Reddick, and for me, which was a miss because I had been on Reddick through these races, and I tried to chase him after that. This was the race that Reddick showed up on. Didn't have him. He still made a mistake. Finished last to be optimal. Best car last year at Darlington too. Best car at the spring race this time around at Darlington. We look back at this race, Darlington 2, which was this one here. Reddick starts second, finishes third, leads 90 laps in this race. Okay, I have him as the uh, best driver in this race because, you know, everything rotated so much. We had so many guys run into issues and fall out of the race. Reddick, by default, was the best car in the fall race last year. Due to the sheer amount of consistency, despite the fact we lost Christopher Bell, we lost Denny Hamlin, we lost everybody else who was competing for the win, and he's still, you know, like data-wise, best guy last year in the race. Wasn't able to get the win, you know, couldn't beat Larson. He was just like constantly the second best car, right? Um, you know, this is where Hamlin was, even though he, you know, finished poorly, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, this is where you get into... Guys run lap down or they drop a lot of positions. When I start running everything, I try and just look at where people were at in terms of their car. Uh, you can argue second best car or first. You can argue best car last fall for Reddick at Darlington. Best car car at the spring race for Darlington this year. Ran in the wall, like finishes last, you know. And so you start looking at right around like where Reddick is going. You argue or you bring up the fact that we've looked at how volatile this race is for lap leaders. Like that's kind of not a fan of Reddick here, man. I'm really kind of not a fan of his price and where he's at here. You look at Byron, who's been pretty much the second best driver consistently at Darlington. When you look at the entirety of where they run, like where they've been at in these races, like you pretty much always see Byron, uh, we can find a little fella. Starts fifth in the spring, finishes sixth. We look at this race here. Byron starts 23rd, drives through the field, finishes fourth. We look at this race here. Byron goes from fourth and, and wins the race, uh, spring race last year. We look at the fall race in the 2022. We, we see Byron start third, finish eighth. We look at the spring race in 2022. We see Byron start ninth, finish 13th. And so... Pretty much, you know, I don't really pay, I don't really look at track history that much, but you look at his track history, then you look at where he's been at in these races, and this is pretty much where Byron is, pretty much fourth best driver across the board at any race. It goes back to the default, like, oh, you probably want 15% of Byron at every track every week. Uh, we, we see that he doesn't have the speed that he had last year. He has certainly fallen off. And this isn't all necessarily running into issues or wrecks. It's just kind of where he's at in terms of speed. But that's where he is. We look at Brad, who had a phenomenal run to end the season last year. It would make sense that he eventually got a win. Um, but he has been all over the place. So you look at the sketchiness of Byron, Reddick, and Keselowski here. And you're like, why is Truex like not the most expensive guy? Why is he not? Why is he not? Why, why is he so far down the line here? You know, you look at Truex, you look at Bell, uh, you look at, you know, Elliot. Like, these are guys, when we're looking at trying to get as many potential lap leaders as possible, you start looking at this 9K range, 9, 9, 9, you know. I'm not trying to speak German there. I'm just saying that, like, I don't think you really need the 11K range. Like, there, there's a lot of potential builds that either eliminate the 10 and 11K range and or just one of those guys plus the 9k guys plus the entire 5k value is is there to either punt double punt um and maybe i'm running around in circles and maybe i'm saying a lot and contradicting myself but like when we look at everybody in this race or you know at the zarnton race nearly 400 laps 
we've 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 under we we understand why so many people are in play to potentially get laps led and fast laps. I'm not saying you do this with like one lineup, but the 9K range looks extremely good. It makes a lot of sense of why, hey, maybe you don't want to go to the 10K range. You stay in the nine, you stay in the five, you you go to the value punt or double punt or whatever, and you have a really good chance of still getting two to three lap leaders, even if you don't have Hamlin, you don't have Larson, you don't have Byron, you don't have Reddick. Um, now, yet again, people will say or come back to this or maybe view that as Sunday morning, I said, hey, you know, Brandon, in the previous video on Thursday, you said uh, we don't want to play 10K guys. Like, you can play 9K guys. Like, of course, things change. Um, but, like, with how open it is and how soft this pricing is, like, you can realistically see, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here to not pay up top. And so, really, like, pricing doesn't matter this week. It really, really doesn't. Like, we can make arguments for nearly everybody here. Um, which, yet again, why I have been going more and more of not being lazy. I don't think it's that lazy, but, you know, it really is like DFS is based on what the projections are and where people are at. We don't know where we don't know what the projections are until people queue. It's kind of useless looking at races early in the week and, and doing pre videos. Uh, at least for me, I have found diminishing returns of, you know, like what I'm looking at here. Uh, now I will say the Chris Busher, uh, runs are pretty impressive here. I mean, that's, that's decent to see decent to see rather, um, you know, Gibbs is all over the place, but still we can see anything from him. We have seen track house and Chastain, pretty much fall to a 10th place guy in, in, in general. Now, this is somebody who's like, I don't really, I mean, outside of the race last year that he had a chance of winning and still ran to issues when they were running the Coca-Cola cars and the throwback schemes, I believe it was last spring, uh, he is defaulting to like a 10th best car. Like we, the days of playing Chastain until we start seeing, you know, a return in form are, are kind of disappearing there. Kyle Busch, who, you know, very much up and down, like, we probably need to start playing Kyle Busch again. Probably need to start having exposure to Bubba Wallace at his discounted rate. Bowman, if we like the other Hendrick guys, and we know Byron's, like, defaulting to fifth, Elliott's there, Larson's there, like, Bowman seems to be underpriced slightly compared to where he's at. Uh, Jones is just going to have pricing because it's Jones at Darlington now. Yet again, we look at two races now. Yet again, he won the spring, if I'm not mistaken, last year. Fall, maybe he won the fall, who cares? I mean, this is where he was at, ninth best car, fall race last year. You know, coming off his injury, 25th best car, I don't see a reason to play Jones at all. Don't don't see a reason. That is ownership, maybe not chalk, but ownership we can identify and probably view as bad ownership uh, based on track history because we're not seeing anything from a legacy motorsport club at all i gotta wrap this up i gotta i gotta work mean in five minutes looks like a berry really fast who did have speed in the in the fall which is good to see i mean like shr really is returning to form uh gregson concerned that he's going to get in the wall but uh still there in play probably not doing cindric he's right where he should be gillen's kind of falling off a cliff um let's see where michael is I mean, you can argue, I mean, you can be like, oh, kind of in play, not in play. Like, all these guys are the exact same. Probably not going to play Shane. Going to be a very difficult race for Shane. Um, it's almost detriment that he's running Xfinity because that might teach him some bad habits about getting into the wall, and you do not want to get in the wall in these cars at Darlington. Like, that That really is a shame. Like, you know, people want to run the Darlington Stripe. Let me tell these guys I'm going to be slightly uh, off really fast here. Hold on. Um, who was I, who was I talking about? Oh yeah. Yeah. Like the, the next gen car cannot survive wall contact to the right rear. Okay. So like any contact at all is detrimental to anybody in this race. I would pin that. I would push that against, um, sin. That's injury. I, 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 I'd hold that as a detriment against Shane, uh, Stenhouse who hasn't done anything remarkable here outside of just wreck in certain situations or damage his car. Like, I don't see a reason to really jump on Stenhouse. 
Host of ours said he was a fan of this race uh, once. Now, granted, that could be the first race he did. Uh, but Host of Art has honestly been oddly comfortable with this car and this track. Uh, so, you know, we look at, like, not interested in Cindric, not going to play Todd, not looking really at Suarez, not looking at Shane, probably not Dylan, probably not uh, Stenhouse. And then, hey, you know, we're in the value range again, who I just said all these guys are in play. And so, really, the only right, the only people I'm not really looking at I would argue, just right off the bat, yet again, this is Thursday, anything can happen, but it's these individual drivers in the mid-range. It's kind of like a dead zone. Ironically, that's kind of where we're looking at in the Xfinity Series. In the Cup Series, this isn't really the place we want to be at, okay? You make arguments for Gregson, McDowell. I mean, you could make plus or minuses for these guys regardless or, you know, in any situation. But these are probably the least likely appealing guys entering the weekend, okay? But then you get to Carson Hosevar, you get to Harrison Burton, who, like, Her- I mean, okay, sure, we're not playing Burton, but, like, LaJoy's going to run long. We see that he has tremendous upside of where he can potentially be at in certain races compared to his pricing. Yet again, we know Haley's going to be there. Yet again, Priest is uh, up and down, uh, very, very volatile there. Nemechek, if he can finish a race, might potentially, you know, have the 22nd best car. But you look at Zane, who... Now, yet again, this is just where he's been at, but he's had much better finishes uh, in these races. This is just where he's at in terms of speed. Like, I'm I'm, I'm up for, Z- for Zane. I'm up for Hemrick. I mean, you look at what Hemrick did at Dover. You look at what he did at Charlotte. I mean, this is why we play these guys here to run the situation where they run long. They get lucky on a yellow. Like, all these guys are in play. You look at Kaz Grala. Yeah, sure, this is where he's been at, but he's finished better. You know, you look at Cody Ware. Slow, 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 Pocono, but he finished well at Pocono. Like, everybody in this, everybody here, everybody here is in play. Everybody from Bowman up is in play. This is, this is, this would kind of be the designated dead zone uh, in just salary or potential building wise. Yet again, previewing this race on a Thursday entering the week. That's, uh, that's kind of where we're at. Just, you know, summing it up really fast. Very volatile race for potential lap leaders i would argue to try and get as many people in your lineup from alex bowman to hamlin up that would dictate probably quite a few nine and eight k guys but you could have a very very strong lineup in the eight and nine k range this weekend you know yet again this would be a great race if you're doing a 20 max you know spread ownership out have ownership you know cap at like 45 for you know any individual driver and have you know a lot of drivers from like 40 to probably 25 percent you know that would probably be the smartest way to approach this race um at least on the outside looking in once q comes through and we see where people are at and where they're starting like that'll show us where everybody is based on projections and the likelihood that they either succeed or they don't succeed um but this is where i'm at entering this darlington race uh maybe this helps you maybe it doesn't but either way i'll see you guys in live shows saturday and sunday so i'll see you guys then